Brent and I had a really interesting conversation the other day. Uh, he got on Skype with me and um, we decided to have some fun, basically just kind of spending time with each other. And we decided to use the Church of Gale brain and memory reads on myself, on Brent, and even on Lauren McBride and some psychopaths, because we were trying to decide what to do with some criminals that I've been dealing with. And um, that was on February the 6th. And we decided to use the Church of Gale brain scan scanners and memory reads to explore our past. And we learned that crazy people or psychopaths often have a director version inside of themselves that protects the diseased version from being caught, so to speak. And this explains why Jesuits like Lori McBride and Camilla Alves can appear so normal when they make public presentations. But you know, when they're meeting privately with Brent, they're crazy psycho women. And um, we just, he, uh, Brent told me that a lot of older women are very turned on by the thought of a younger man and they don't care whether the guy has low IQ. So I said, well, that's not how I feel. And I said, do, do brain reads on me and find out what you're finding on my attitude towards younger men. And Brent said, our brain reads show that you prefer men with maturity and that for the most part, younger men aren't usually close enough to your level intellectually for you to find them attractive. Oh, that's my music in the background. I'm plugging my new album, which I'm offering for free to the public. Uh, Brent said there are some exceptions like Matthew McConaughey and the reads also say that I'm turned on the most by hot brains and hot hearts, not hot bodies. And I was amazed. I said that is exactly how I feel. Those brain reads are right on, just accurate. And then um, I asked Brent to a brain, do a brain scan. They can actually go back into our memories on how I felt about Matthew McConaughey in November 2005 when I was trying to make up my mind about him. And the memory reads on me, Brent said, showed that I was hesitant about Brent, I mean Matthew being a younger man and was on the fence at first, but decided to trust Vladimir Putin's judgment on his character. And I thought, that's exactly how I felt. I couldn't make up my mind about Matthew McConaughey. Uh, that this was back in November 2005 when a uh, Vladimir was thinking of adding him onto the marriage list. At that time, it was just me and Vladimir Putin. Those were the only men that I was interested in romantically. Then I said, Brent, let's go back to 1991. <clears throat> I've got yeast infection all in my <clears throat> body and it gives me congestion. <clears throat> or should I say yeast toxin? So, so I asked Brent to go back to 1991, and he said that the reads revealed that I was shocked that Brent was my mystery caller, but <clears throat> that's allergy, but very turned on. It wasn't that Brent was a celebrity, which didn't matter to me. It was his passion and devotion, as well as the connection that we had made. It was like traveling through a long, cold winter and coming upon a warm, blazing fire. And I couldn't escape the cold winter that my ex had put me in but I could settle in next to Brent's heat and relax, knowing it was this warm and invigorating love that kept me alive. I thought that's exactly how I felt. And Brent just kind of put in his own words because uh, when they go in, when they use these memory reads, the person can actually experience what the person was feeling. <clears throat> Boy, uh, that Seroquel is taking out all the the yeast toxin, but it, I'm allergic to yeast toxin, so it causes my voice to get clogged up. Okay, so I was amazed at the accuracy. I said, that's exactly how I felt. And I remember back then I was thinking if Brent was a missionary, I could have him. And I thought back then he had a heart beautiful enough to be a missionary like my hero, Hudson Taylor, a missionary doctor to China in the 19th century. I then asked Brent to do a brain reading how he felt about me. He said he was so in love with me, he felt like he was going insane. He was thinking about me every moment, so much that he was aroused all day long. And as soon as he got any second alone, he thought only of pleasuring himself to the thought of making love to me. And when he called me on the phone back, though, that, back then in 1991, that's what I sensed. I could tell he was feeling that way about me. It really turned me on. And... You know, 
Brent said when he got the cassette that I made of myself singing and playing piano, and you're hearing some background music, I tried to replicate that the best I could. Lori McBride destroyed it uh, when she forced, when she drug raped Brent in September 1992, and she basically broke into his house and just camped out there. She destroyed anything that he had that I gave him, like the cassette tape or any videos that I sent him. So I decided it's not fair to Brent. And he's living at Church of Gale now, and Lori McBride is not allowed on Church of Gale, so it's safe for me now to, to st I tried to replicate this tape <clears throat> that I made back then, which caused him to fall crazy in love with me. You're kind of hearing that music in the background. And I'm going to have a link. I actually made this into an album. So I want the world to listen to the music that Brent heard that made him fall in love with me, crazy in love with me. And I could tell. He was so crazy about me. That's why I know that he did not want Lori McBride in 1992. It's like he said, he was aroused all day long. And as soon as he got any second alone, he thought of only pleasuring himself to the thought of making love to me. So <clears throat> the Jesuits are attacking my voice. Parent. They don't like it that I've been making this music album, but fortunately I'm done with the album right now, so I don't need to sing today. So just that my talking voice is not the greatest. So I didn't make a copy of the tape that I sent him, but I do recall that I stayed up all night making it. And then I used a dot matrix printer to make a copy of the letter I mailed him with the tape, which has miraculously survived my chaotic life. I have links for all this underneath this video. You've got to hear this music. It really makes our love story come alive. And you know, when he, he Brent said that after he heard me sing, he was a love struck mess. That tape that I mailed him of my singing and piano playing, and I no longer have a piano, to reward him for the form letter he sent me in September 1990, appreciating my letters to him was very, very special. And um, I received Brent's letter and you're going to see it all in a link underneath this video. It was in a white business size envelope when I lived in Miami. It had an Atlanta postmark and was forwarded from my previous address. I had moved several times when I lived in Miami in, in 1990. There was no return address on the envelope. I could tell Brent was worried if he put the return address on it that I wouldn't get it. So apparently he had sent me something earlier and I didn't receive it. So either my husband or the Jesuits sabotaged it. I never did receive an autograph photo from him, though I think he sent me one. I received a letter on just plain white paper, and it just said, Dear Mrs. Schuler, I apologize for the lateness of this reply, but due to my schedule on Star Trek The Next Generation and off, I'm behind on my mail. Thank you for sharing your thoughts with me. They were read with appreciation. Thank you for your comments about my portrayal of data. They were read with interest. I hope you continue to watch and enjoy the show. Sincerely, Brent Spiner, and he signed his first and last name. Like with a big B and an S like this, and P like that. I remember, I, I practically memorized his signature because I analyzed it later, trying to figure out who my mystery caller was. I started getting strange phone calls in 1991 with a, a velvet voice. And I could tell the guy was dreaming about me 24 He was crazy about me, whoever he was. I hung up on him the first couple times. I would... So I said, now, Brent, let's do brain reads on how I felt about um, you being my mystery caller. And basically, I was just shocked. Um, I was shocked that he was my mystery caller, but very turned on, like I said. Okay, so um, within one month after he got my tape, he started working on Old Yellow Eyes is Back, which was his first music album. And at that time, I didn't know Brent could sing so well. And inspired by Brent's love, I studied writing at the Institute of Children's Literature, and I happened to get a very good writing teacher who was an award-winning children's author, Jim Murphy. And my first novel, Silver Skies, was an attempt to capture in words the sublimity that Brent brought to me. And I sang a version of I'll Be With You in Apple Blossom Time, which I've included in my album. I've got a link for my album underneath this video. And um, I haven't heard any version of I'll Be With You in Apple Blossom Time 
that really captures the feel of how I would want my book, Silver Skies, to be portrayed as a movie. So I decided to do the performance myself. Um, the, the versions that I hear online of I'll Be With You and Apple Blossom Times sound too honky-tonk, and I wanted it to be more a testament of true love. And, a, and I, I made a performance, which I did myself, which is my favorite version of I'll Be With You and Apple Blossom Time, my own performance. <laughs> so... Because I don't, I haven't heard any performance that I like. It's this is the the version I hope they use it that Steven Spielberg will work rework into the movie version of um, Silver Skies, which starred Matthew McConaughey as Dor. That was in two thousand five. Um, so I asked Brent how he felt in nineteen ninety six when I learned about Lori and dumped him in my heart as a lover. He says he was so depressed it was like he wasn't alive. Lori had put him in his own cold winter. And he didn't even have my fire to keep him warm. He felt like he would die. But he was willing to keep me alive no matter what the cost. Lori threatened to kill me if he wouldn't do what she wanted. So even if I didn't love him anymore because he loved me even more than himself, he couldn't let Lori near me. He'd rather take the trauma and torture himself than risk giving it to me. I figured that out in 1999 and I cried for three hours on the phone because Jesus told me in a still small voice that Lori was a Vatican agent. And I said, oh, gee. I, so I said, now, Brent, let's go to 1999. How were you feeling when I was crying for three hours on the phone and asking you to forgive me for not understanding what Lori put you through? Say, so how'd you figure this out? Which, well, I was, I, I, it's like all my doctors and everybody, the police department, everybody got taken over by this woman. And she just was so powerful. And she was ruining my life, poisoning my supplements, my prescription meds. I mean, trying to set fire to my mobile home. And I thought, man, how does, how could this woman be so good? And then the Lord told me in a still small voice, right as I had just come back from a doctor's visit where the doctor said, you have calcium deposits in your, um, in your breast and you may have breast cancer. I went to God in prayer. He said, don't worry about it. They're just trying to get you under general, general anesthesia so they can put poison in your body, which was correct. But that's another story. So I'm not going to go there right now. The main point is that Brent was crying right along with me when I found out about Lori. And he was begging me to forgive him in his heart. He was feeling guilty that he had to take her as a girlfriend, even though he never wanted her. Um, so anyways, I, I have like a link that summarizes more of the fascinating conversation with uh, Brent and myself. And... Um, for instance, in 1996, when I, um, oh, I asked Brent, how did Lori feel when I um, uh, found out she was a Vatican agent and told you about it? He said she was gleeful. She didn't care that I figured out she was a Vatican agent at first because she knew it was too late, that the damage had been done. However, she was enraged when she found out that I forgave Brent and couldn't believe it. And that's because Jesuits don't understand true love or forgiveness. And Lori felt surges of hate and jealousy towards me and was enraged at Brent uh, for loving me. She was ready to up the torture and abuse in order to break Brent and, um, and to punish him for loving me. She was jealous of me. And even though she didn't love Brent, she still saw Brent as her possession and wanted him all for herself. That's what we determined from the brain reads. We can actually get reads. And all the memory, even though Lori's been executed several times because she's got a lot of clones, all the memories get transferred to the clones. That's how the Jesuits do it. So she raped Brent in order to break and torture him, but also because she enjoyed it. And as she became more attached to the toy, her Brent, that the Jesuits promised would be hers, she raped him even more furiously, furiously thinking it would eventually make him love her. That's what we determined on the brain reads. She would occasionally spontaneously rape other men during this time, too, in order to keep her abilities sharp. She's a born and bred Jesuit. Jesus says that Brent was very brave. Anyways, um, we, we came to some other conclusions that are pretty interesting, but I'm mainly making this video to let you know that I've tried, I've made a, an album that's very close to what Brent received in 1990 that caused him to fall crazy in love with me. A love that's lasted for like 26 years. You got to check this album out. It's uh, it's very close to what Brent heard. It makes our love story come alive. <laughs>